But one good thing about all this traveling that I've done of late is, is, is this. Man, I've seen the power of God lately. I have seen the power of God. I've seen it from a historical perspective in Israel, obviously, going to all these sites where Jesus walked and Abraham walked. And, right? I, I've seen all these things that just really made the Spirit of God so real to me and all of his experiences real to me. Um, it was awesome. And then I saw God work in the hearts of the people that were there just like he was working in mine. So I saw the power of God in us. And then we come home, we spend a couple of days and turn around and go to Brazil. And then I saw the power of God. That's the folks that went last year. You see the power of God in an amazing way when you go and just sell out to see Jesus work and, and, and do what he does. And it led me to this question as I pre prepared this text for us. Are we seeing the power of God here? Are we? Are we seeing it internationally? I didn't really keep up with the news, but needless to say, while I was gone, some crazy stuff happened, right? The world's a terrible place. How many of you realize that the airport that I flew in and out of was bombed while we were over there? Yeah. And then all this craziness that they uh, are trying to stop as Brazil faces the Olympic Games that are coming and terrorist group after terrorist group are trying to just blow people up for the sake of. Are we seeing the power of God internationally through us? Nothing like we used to. You, back, you go back and read the story of those 19th century leaders from, from our churches, and they turned the world upside down. Billy Sunday, D.L. Moody, right? Are we seeing the power of God regionally? How's the state of South Carolina working out for us right now? Are we seeing the hand of God on our state? Are we seeing him locally? Are we seeing the power of God at all? And how would we know if we were that's what we're going to talk about today. You're going to need to open your Bibles to 2 Timothy 3. And while you're turning there, let me give you a little bit of background. Most of you probably know this, but 2 Timothy is a letter written by a mentor, a pastoral mentor, to a young pastor that he is mentoring. So you've got the Apostle Paul, probably the most famous evangelist missionary in, in all of space and time. And he came across this young man named Timothy, and Timothy just had the Spirit of God on him. So God took Timothy as a minister is supposed to do when someone comes to them and, and says they have a call from God. God took Tim, Paul took Timothy under his wing and he mentored him and he taught him what it is to be a pastor and to lead a church. And he prepared him with what it would take to lead the churches that he was in into the future. And some of the things that he did to prepare him were revolved around knowing what to look for as the church progressed. Right? Here's some things that you can expect to see as the church progresses. And as we turn to 2 Timothy 3, we'll see the things that Paul told Timothy. And we're going to work through this thing incrementally rather than reading the whole text as we do some days. Let's just start with verse 1. He says, look, but know this. Timothy, know this. Difficult times will come in the last days. He says, Timothy, look, mark this down. It's going to happen. It's a guarantee. There are going to be terrible, hard, difficult times ahead in the last days of this church. And in the verbiage that Paul used, what he's saying to Timothy is essentially, look, and these last days are already at hand. We're already on the precipice of going into these last days where the things that I'm going to warn you about in the next few sentences are going to occur. And I sit and I think, well, that, that was 2,000 years ago, give or take 30 years. And so this young preacher is given this letter by this wonderful apostle, and he's warned about what's going to happen in the church in the last days. And we look back on the things now, almost 2,000 years later, and we're going to parallel the warnings that Timothy received from Paul to some of the things we may be seeing ourselves in 21st century, century America. Because you know what I believe? Man, I believe we're standing on the edge even now. And you, you all know me. I'm not the preacher that stands up every week and says, boy, get ready. Jesus is coming back tomorrow. I just simply hope that he does. But we're not allowed to know the dates and the times. And, and so uh, I tend to focus more on if Jesus did come back tomorrow, would our lives change? What would we do if we knew that he was going to? But this text is all about being able to look at the signs of the times 
and to know that the approaching day of Christ's return is imminent. Does this make sense? When you start seeing these things, Timothy, as a pastor, be aware Jesus could come back at any moment, right? So let's look and see what these things are. We're going to read verses 2 through 4. Let's read one again. But know this, difficult times will come in the last days. And here's a list of things. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money. They'll be boastful, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Let's stop there for a moment, and then we'll pick back up there in just a second. Timothy, my son, young pastor, here's how you're going to know that the time is shortening and to the end of times are approaching. As you see these things, your window of opportunity is closing. And there's less time to do the works of service. There's less time to be Jesus to your world. Let's see where the window of opportunity stands for us today, these 2,000 years later. He says, here's how you're going to know that it's the last days because people will be these things. And he gives us a list. What's the first things that people will be? They'll be selfish, right? In the last times, people will be selfish. They'll love only themselves. All that will matter to them is their own pleasure. Secondly, in the last days, Timothy, people will love money. And they'll also be, well, be very unhappy with what they have. They will covet what they don't have, and that will be the most important thing in the world to them. They'll be boastful. They'll be empty pretenders. They'll brag to make themselves look better, but their braggadocious nature will be empty. There will be no substance to it. They'll be proud. They'll be haughty. They'll think they're better than everyone else. They'll be blasphemers. They'll be speaking evil of or even railing against God. They'll be disobedient to their parents. And not only that, but they'll be unwilling to be persuaded that that is the case. They'll be ungrateful. They'll be thankless. They'll be entitled. These are the things that they deserve. This, is, should just, this should just be mine because I deserve it. I shouldn't have to put any time or an investment into this thing. There should be no gratitude on my part. I got this coming. And they won't only, only be ungrateful, they'll be unholy. People will become more and more wicked. They'll become more and more profane. And they'll be unloving. They'll be without love, or some texts say they will be without the natural affections for others. They will be unnatural in their affections. I could preach a sermon simply on that. But you know what the reference really lends itself to? Here's what he's saying. So in the last days, people won't love their families like they're supposed to. Parents won't love their children right. Children won't love their parents right. Husbands won't love their wives right. Wives won't love their husbands right. It's going to be an unloving culture as the days draw to a close and in the window of opportunity shrinks shut. Not only that, they'll be irreconcilable. What does that mean? They will be promise breakers. They'll make a truce and they'll break it. They'll give you their word, and it won't matter. They'll do what they want to do, not what they say they're going to do. They'll be slanderers. Now, we're not going to have a Greek lesson for every single one of these words, but I installed the Greek word for this one because you need to hear it. You know what the word for slanderer is? Diabolos. Diabolos. What does that mean? What does that sound like? The devil. People lie about others. They'll gossip. And it will be malicious. 
this gossip. You know what people will do? They'll talk down about others to make themselves look better. They'll be undisciplined. They'll be unable to control themselves. They'll be incontinent is the literal translation of this word. Now, Shelley's trying to help me to speak appropriately in appropriate places. But when we hear the word incontinent, what do we think of? We think of depends, right? When an adult gets to the place where they can no longer, no longer control their facilities. Timothy, as the days come to a close, people will get to the place where they're so far gone, they won't even be able to control themselves anymore. They will have no discipline. They'll run around like headless chickens. They'll be brutal. They'll be fierce. They'll be cruel. The literal meaning, they'll be untamed. They will be like the savage beast. That's the verbiage that's used here. I learned something in Brazil. We have a statement here. We have a way of saying, see if you've ever said this. Let's say you're talking about, I don't know, Todd Gurley or LeBron James or somebody like that. Some athlete that is just unbelievably gifted. They should not be able to do the things that they do. And we would say, man, that guy's a beast, right? You ever said it? Oh, he or she is a beast. There's just no dealing with them. And I said that a couple of times to my Brazilian friends, and I said it as a flattering phrase. I said, oh, Pedro, you're a bista. And he was offended. Because it doesn't mean the same thing there that it means here. You know what it means there? It means I'm calling him an animal that can't control himself. So I had to come up with a new word. That's what this means. People will become like wild animals. And they will just hurt and devour others if it makes themselves better. They will hate goodness. They'll hate goodness. And they'll do nothing to relieve the pain of others. They won't do what's right by people. In fact, they will hate it. Because why? Because it gets in the way of what they want to do for themselves. They'll be traitors. They will betray your trust. Timothy, in the last days, the people of the church will betray you. Be prepared. They'll betray their countries. They'll betray their teams, their churches. They'll betray their friends. They'll betray their families. Bunch of traitors. And they'll be reckless. There'll be no thought for the consequences. Well, if I do this, this may happen. Oh, that's not even in the... Conversation, they'll just do what they want to do and they'll worry about the details later because they're undisciplined. And in all of this, they'll be conceited. They'll be puffed up with the pride that we've already talked about. They'll think they're better than everybody else, said a different way. You know what it is? The attitude of this is like, well, I'm just above all that. I'm different. I don't have to worry about all those things. I'm more important. I'm more special. Don't you know who I am? That stuff doesn't apply to me. I'm different. I'm special. Right? Then it's encapsulated for us in verse 4. If you mark in your Bible, you may mark this phrase. You know how badly I hate to stand up and list, pray about a list of behaviors? It's just not how I'm wired. This is not fun for me. But this is the way to encapsulate all these 17 traits of the end times people they will be lovers of pleasure rather than what? Lovers of God. So let's encapsulate this whole thing. The people in the last days, Timothy, here's how they're going to be. They're going to have a love for pleasure that's greater than their love for God. Now, folks, we can look at the world and say, you know what? That gone. Jesus is liable to come back in 15 seconds. That's the world we live in, right? Does that sound familiar? Sounds like us, doesn't it? Sounds like our world, right? No wonder it's such a scary time to live. No wonder it's so awful for people in the world today because this is how the people of the world are today. Is that true? Well, yeah, it is true. That's what we're facing today as a church as 
we try to minister to the people in our circles of influence. That's what we're going to see in the church. But let me ask you a question. What if we looked inwards? What if we looked at ourselves based on what's told to this young pastor to expect as a sign of the times of the last of days? What if we looked at ourselves and say, okay, do we, in, do we have the kinds of traits that say the window of opportunity is closing on us? We're almost out of time. Verse 5. People will love pleasure rather than be lovers of God. And you may say, well, Stuart, why are you picking on church members? Because this is talking about the world. Hold on, is it? Holding to the form of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid these people. Is he warning Timothy about the world or about his church? Does the world put on the pretense that they're godly? Are they out there trying to parade around like they're God? Well, of course they're not. They don't know God. That's our job. Having to, holding to the form of godliness. Here's what we have. We have the outward appearance of some religion. Right? Oh, these people look religious. They wear the right clothes, go to the right place. Boy, 11 o'clock on Sunday, all things are right. But it's not true Christian faith. Look at me. If we want to know whether we're doing the things that we ought to do or not, this text tells us how we will know. Those are the evidences of things that identify the end of times. Let me ask you, are we in or nearing the ends of times where our window will close and we will no longer have opportunity to do the things of God? Are we getting closer to that? Absolutely. Now, let's turn the script around a little bit and let's look to ourselves. Does this apply to us as a church? Here's what the text says will be the identifier to the application to the church. We will love pleasure more than we'll love God. How will we know that that's what we're doing? Because there will be a form of godliness, but there will be no power. Did you catch that? There will be a form of godliness. It'll look religious. It'll look good on the surface, but it will be totally fake, totally hypocritical. It'll be absolutely empty because there won't be any power within it. True Christian faith is powerful. But the people that Timothy was warned about may have never even experienced the power of God in their lives in the first place. I have to wonder, have you ever experienced the power of God in your life? I wonder. Because how do you turn away from that? If you've ever had an experience with God and you know he's good and you see what he's capable of and how powerful he truly is, you see him drop down from heaven and poke holes in the darkness and take a demon-possessed woman and turn her into a mother a lover of God and a Christian leader, and you've seen that, and yet you say, yeah, that's pretty good, but I'll take a boat on the lake for 500, Alex. I'm not calling you liars. I promise you I'm not. But I'll tell you what I think. Once a person's experienced the love of God and the power of God, nothing else will ever do. You spend the rest of your life trying to figure out how to live there. Peter, James, and John on the Transfiguration Mount will preach this in a couple of weeks. The power of God showed up and they said, hey, let's build tents and let's stay here forever. Oh, let's don't let this get away from us. The window of opportunity will close and we'll no longer have access to a power like this. How do we keep this here? And you know what God said? You keep this here by listening to my son and doing what he told you. He's the power. And then he left and he said, you're going to be my power. All authority has been given to me. In heaven and in earth, you go make disciples. I leave my power with you. Teach them, preach them, baptize them, show them the love of God, and then raise them up to love me like, them, like they're supposed to and love their neighbors as themselves. If you guys will just do that, it'll all be good. But here's what's going to happen if the church doesn't do that, Timothy. It's going to start looking like this, 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 this. People are going to love their pleasures more than they love God. They're going to put on a great show, but there'll be no power where they are. With their lives, they deny the power of godliness. Do we see that around here? That's between, right? That's not my job. My job is to sow the seed and let God do with it through his spirit what he wants to. But what does Paul say to Timothy to do with these people? Look at your verse 5. 
If you see people who have a form of godliness, but they de- deny the power of God, here's, Timothy, here's what I want you to do. What does he say? You tell me. You preach it. It's in the text. Avoid those people. Avoid them. Shazam. Let's back up a little bit. Are we talking about Christians or non-Christians here? Are we talking about the world or the church? What are we talking about? This is the church. This pastor's being warned about what's going to go on in his congregation as the times grow near and as the window of opportunity closes. He says, you're going to have people like this in your congregations, and here's what I want you to do. What? Avoid them. How do you do that? That doesn't sound like 21st century Christianity and pastoring and mentoring, does it? We chase them around and beg them. Avoid these people. Have nothing to do with them. Well, folks, what if they're members of your church? Verses 6 through 9. For among them are those who worm their way into households and capture idle women. Ladies, before you flip out, I'll talk about this in a moment. Burdened down with sins, led along by a variety of passions, always learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jammers resisted Moses, so, th- so these also resist the truth. Men who are corrupt in mind, worthless in regard to the faith. But they will not make any further progress, for their lack of understanding will be clear to all as theirs was also. Let's pause there just for a second. They prey on those. These people prey on others. Well, what a coincidence. Misery loves company. You know what makes people feel a whole lot better about their sin? If they can look at others and say that they're doing it too. Oh, you ever told your kid, what are you doing? Oh, well, he did it. She did it. What's that got to do with you? What's that have to do with you? They pray on. Now, listen, ladies. One of the things that really shocked me about my trip to the Middle East or my, my subsequent trip to the Middle East, you need to praise your Father in heaven that you were born here, girls. You have no idea how blessed you are to be a woman born in the States. The reality of it is in the culture that this was occurring in, which is essentially Turkey, Western Turkey. How's Turkey looking nowadays? This took place in Western Turkey. That's where this church was. And let me just say, women were slightly better than animals. They were property. It's all that they were. And all God's trying to do is say, look, this curse is real. This is not how I designed or intended it. Somehow or another though, folks, wherever you happen to be, you've got to learn to bloom where you're planted. That's all I can tell you because there's only one way to overcome the curse and that's Jesus and that's an eternal plan. We'll give you an abundant life as much as we can where you are now, but that abundant life is going to involve you being able to look at your life and say, well, at least I have Christ. At least I see the power of God. This is not a perfect situation. This stinks, but I have Jesus. So what they're really saying, and women were, the, are, women were and are very, very vulnerable in Middle Eastern society, they're hopeless and they're helpless, which makes them what? It makes them susceptible, vulnerable to false religion. Well, let's extend that to ourselves today. Are there people in our world, in our churches, in our lives who are susceptible or vulnerable to false religion? They must be because it's doing a whole lot better job than the real thing's doing. The liar's knocking it out of the park. The power of God's disappearing faster than we can say power of God. Now, who are these people? Just so that we'll know that he's not just a misogynist picking on women. Who does he say these people are? They're the people who are burdened with guilt. How many times have we said in this room, guilt's from the devil. Guilt that leads nowhere but to feeling guilty is from the devil. That's the most effective force that the enemy has today for us. That's a lie. Because what it says to you is, oh, well, you you can't be any better than this. You can't do any better than this. You're guilty. You're going to stay guilty. That's where you're going to remain, and that's where you're going to die, in guilt. And then you feel that big, it's self-defeating, and there's no real coming back from that unless God is introduced in the situation. These people, these false religious, these people who look like Christians, but they don't have the power of God, they're going to prey on the vulnerable. They're going to prey on the weak, and they're going to use their guilt against them. That's what it says. It says, look, they're going to search for the truth forever, but they're never going to find it. 
You know, people who are just, they really want to see some truth. They want to see the real thing, but they look and they look and they look and they look and they never find it. Why don't they ever find it? Well, look at, a li- look at the list above. Look at what they have as an, a- as an example. Look who these people have as mentors within the church. How are they going to find it with that? If the church does nothing more than exhibit these 17 traits, just like the world does, how is a person supposed to find Jesus in that? If everybody puts themselves, their selfishness and their pleasures above their pleasure of God, where in that equation is God going to be seen in their lives? Is it any wonder that the Christian church as we know it, for all intents and purposes, is not growing, it's shrinking? Because they've been preyed upon. And then there's given us an example. This is cool. It says, these people are like Janice and Jambres. Who knows who they are? Oh, cool. We'll, we'll, at least we'll learn a little something interesting today. Traditionally, and I tend to think it's true because Paul cites these guys. Traditionally, Janice and Jambres were the two wizard slash sorcerers who opposed Moses and Aaron when they were trying to lead the people of God out of bondage in Egypt. Right? God would move Moses to work a wonderful miracle and a plague would occur. And these two false religious would actually be able to simulate a lot of these things. Don't, be, don't miss it. The devil's got power. Miraculous power for all intents and purposes as far as we're able to discern with our own limited abilities. But these two guys, they withstood Moses and Aaron in their attempts to deliver the people of Egypt from bondage. These two guys were the ones that were there saying, you know, these guys are trying to lead you out of your oppression. They're trying to break your chains. They're trying to show you amazing grace. Whatever we do, we got to oppose them because if they do that, what are we going to have left? Boy, that sounds like the devil in the Eden. That sounds like the Pharisee in the times of Christ. And it sounds like the Church of America in the 21st century, if you ask me. They resist the word of God. They resist the truth in corruption. They can't stand the truth because they're corrupt. They're worthless in regards to faith. And eventually they will be buried under the truth that they resist. Did you catch that? We sit back and we say, man, woe is me. This is terrible. It's going to be bad. Yeah, it is. All accounts come due. Huh, we got a bill. And I'm not talking about the fact that Jesus died for our sins and we'll be saved and we'll go to heaven and we don't have to worry about that. That's, a, that's understood. But there is a process called sanctification which says that our tree should be bearing fruit and we'll stand before God and he'll appraise what he's given us and he'll say, well, let's see. You loved your pleasure a whole lot, but what did you do for me with it? Uh, not too good. God will eventually, in his time, not ours, in, this, in his dispensation in the fullness of time, God will deal with all of these things. And the progress of these demonic, lying, cheating, stealing, thieving, greedy, prideful, arrogant, false Christians will be brought to a screeching halt and the window of their opportunity will close as well. Because he's going to reveal their lies just like he did with their father. Is it an accident that the word diabolos was used to describe these people? I don't think it is. I think the church is full of people that are doing nothing more than serving Satan. If they looked like wolves, we wouldn't let them in. Didn't Jesus say, beware of wolves, they'll come in sheep's clothing. They'll look just like the real thing. Stranger danger. Amber alert. Problem, problem, problem. Whatever you do, avoid them because they'll take you down with them. They're going to lie to people. They're going to steal from people. They're going to gossip about people. What they're going to do is kill the church from the inside out. They're wolves. They're going to prey on the sheep. You put the two texts together. It's not creative license. That's systematic theology. Let's talk about Janice and Jambres for another quick second. You realize they were judged by the plagues of God, right? These two guys that opposed Jesus as prophets, you know what happened? It was all encapsulated in a little quick story that happened in Exodus 7, verses 11 and 12. But Aaron walked up to these guys, and they're they're just getting the fight on. It's just warming up. And God told Aaron, he says, I want you to walk up to him, and I want you to throw your staff on the ground. It's going to turn into a snake. We're going to warn them of the poison that's coming, the sin that's coming upon them if they don't change their ways. And these haughty Janice and Jammers says, oh, you think that's good? The boom. Oh, 
Man, he threw his staff down and it became a snake too. And so did the other one. Threw a snake down and became a, a staff down and became a snake too. Wait a minute, is there power in the devil here? Might be, but what happened? Aaron's snake devoured theirs. Swallowed them. What are we supposed to see in that? What did they throw on the ground? The staff. What does the staff use to do? Guide the sheep. The rod's used to punish. The staff's used to guide. What are we supposed to read into that? There's going to be people out there who look like shepherds, but they're really, what? Judas goats. And they're going to lead people to their destruction. They're going to lead people to hell is what they're going to do. And they're going to do it intentionally or unintentionally, but the end result's going to be the same. Because they're using their staff to shepherd the sheep to the wrong place. How many times did Jesus look out and say, false shepherd, false shepherd, false shepherd. I am the good shepherd. Follow me. Let's read 10 to 14. But you, Timothy, and those who are on your team have followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, and endurance, along with the persecutions and sufferings that came to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. What persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from them all. In fact, all those who want to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. Who? By whom? Uh, we just found out by whom. Evil people and imposters will become worse, deceiving and being deceived. As the days draw closer, Timothy, it's going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. And you're going to be persecuted for your faith. Withstand it. But as for you, continuing what you have learned and firmly believed, you know who taught you. He gives us a long list of the evil that he could expect in the future. And then he gives him a, an example of what a Christian leader looks like. 17 things that the evil do. Guess how many are in the list of the righteous? Seven. What is seven indicative of? Completeness. Timothy, here's what a complete Christian will look like. They'll follow my leadership in teaching. They'll trust my staff in teaching. They'll trust my staff in their conduct. They'll trust my staff in their purpose. They'll trust my staff with their faith. They'll trust my staff with their patience. They'll trust my staff with their love, and they will trust my staff with their endurance. Why do they need this endurance? Because there's going to be persecutions and sufferings galore for anybody that really truly tries to, tries to follow Christ. The first seven provide the completeness of the Christian so that they can survive the last two. Because real Christianity inevitably faces persecution. The times will get worse and worse and worse. But they end with rescue if we keep the course of truth and godliness. If you'll figure it out, the pleasures of this life are nothing compared to the pleasures of God because the pleasures of God are permanent. The pleasures of this life you're going to leave. You came naked into the world and you're going to leave it naked. You came in as dust, you're going to leave as dust and you can't take any of this stuff with you. And when you leave, your kids are going to fight over it. Good families are going to become real absolute idiots over your stuff because they're going to love their pleasure more than they love their God because that's what you taught them. But for those who keep the course, of, the course of truth and godliness, guess what's going to happen? They're going to be rescued. Let's apply this and get out of here. When people see us, when people see me, when people see you, well, pretend like you and I are sitting down over a cup of coffee and it's just me and you and I'm asking this question and you're asking this question of me. When people see us, do they see the power of God? Do people see the power of God in you? Or do they just see a really well-polished imposter? How do we know? How do we know? Let's close it out and find out. Pick it up in verse 15. This is going to be familiar to most of you. Very, very familiar. Timothy, you know that from childhood you have known the sacred scriptures which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. How often do we pluck this verse out outside of the context that it's within? Do you see the difference in the meaning of this when you apply it to the text in the chapter that is, that's, that's around it? You're going to be surrounded by the devil, son. And it's going to be rough. 
They're going to be like wolves and you're going to be like sheep. And they're going to devour you every chance they get. Know this, from childhood you have known the sacred scriptures, which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be what? Equipped completely for every good work. Maybe it's time we stop pulling cherry picking those two verses out of where they live. Who's going to see those truths? Contextually speaking, the ones who stand up under the power of the, the enemy from within. How do we know when God's power? I asked you a question. Okay, when you look at yourself and, you, and, 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 and you're standing before God, you say, well, do I see the power of God in my life? You caught there how it told us, right? How do we know? Because when God's power is at work, verse 15 tells us that the gospel message produces the wisdom that leads to salvation. What is this all about? What is this all about? Bringing in the sheaves. Those of you that love an old hymn, you know what that, that, you know what that means, right? The fields are white to harvest. There's just not enough workers to go out there and, 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 and get the work done. But what Jesus would do is bring in the sheaves. Is God's power at work in your life? How do you know? Or is the wisdom of your life leading the others to the wisdom of salvation? If not, then you're probably not where you ought to be at. Neither am I. Are the scriptures equipping you to do the tools of good works within your life? And if they are not, are you the problem or is it the scriptures that are the problem? And since our church is made up of a bunch of individuals, is this our church's life? If people came in here and visited us, I'm not asking if they'd have a nice emotional time, if they'd sing songs, and it'd be no offense to anybody. They heard a sermon, they come out, and they hung out, they drank some coffee, they did all these things. I'm not asking you if they'd have a nice little emotional experience that would make them feel like they went to church, because to me, that sounds like the fake thing. If people came and hung out with us at Gun Branch Church, would they walk out and say, whoo, I experienced the power of God with them people? 